Welcome back, our fellow patriots, to the Patriot Lessons American History and Civics Podcast, where we renew the spirit of America by learning about what makes America the greatest nation in world history, including our founding first principles, key documents and speeches, founding fathers and other great patriots, as well as flags and other key symbols of America. Hosted by Oakland County Circuit Court Judge Michael Warren, who, among other things, is working to pilot online remote jury trials, we continue our intense review of the Declaration of Independence. This in-depth review of the Declaration is necessary because, as many studies have revealed, too many of us need a better understanding of the Declaration, the Constitution, American history, and civics. These are tumultuous times. As this is being recorded, a pandemic has hit our nation. Our economy is at its worst since the Great Depression. Riots and looting have spread throughout the country. Police brutality has become recognized as a stunning reality. And a part of Seattle has basically seceded from the nation. Pride in America has slumped to its lowest point since it has been measured by polls. We are in the middle of a toxic political debate and a presidential election where truth is debased constantly. If we are to get through this period as a strong, unified, and free people, we must understand and embrace the basis for our freedoms and equality. With this special episode, we're going back to the beginning. This episode is being released on the eve of the July 4th holiday in 2020. Actually, July 4th is a terrible name. It's more accurately named Independence Day. In one of the early episodes that Judge Warren cut was a recitation of the full text of the Declaration of Independence. That was before he got the great help from a trio of guest narrators, the dynamic Dr. David Dwenke, the bombastic Brent Bassett, and Mike Gerard, me. Hey, by the way, check out my podcast, Be Reasonable with Mike Gerard. Now that we have the wind in our sails, we are returning to recite the full Declaration of Independence in honor of Independence Day. And why? Even if you heard the initial episode, you will learn more about the Declaration in this special episode. And besides, you can never hear the Declaration of Independence too much, especially on or near Independence Day. When we return in just a minute, Judge Warren will set the stage, and then we will listen to some of the most majestic words ever uttered in human history. Fellow Patriots, this episode is sponsored by Anchor, the fabulous app by which this podcast is created and distributed. It is the easiest way to make a podcast. First, it is free. Second, you can record and edit the podcast right in your phone or on your computer. Third, Anchor distributes the podcast for you, or you can manually add platforms. Fourth, you can make money with no minimum listenership. And finally, everything you need to create a podcast can be done through Anchor. If you're interested, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Welcome back, my fellow patriots. I want to note a couple of items before we proceed. Our statistics reveal that we have listeners from across the world, and we absolutely love that. This show really is meant for a global audience, and we are so pleased to reach out to people everywhere. And although the Declaration of Independence is an intensely American document, I personally believe it expresses universal first principles that should apply everywhere. If you agree, please share the show with family, friends, and others interested in our topics, regardless of where you live. Now, as a former member of the Michigan State Board of Education in Michigan, I understand how little our public schools nationwide teach about the Declaration of Independence. This is extremely troubling. The whole point of public education was twofold. First, to teach students how to read so they could read scripture and be saved. And second, to learn about American history, our Declaration of Independence, Constitution, and American civics so they could be fully engaged, educated citizens and soldiers. After all, many of our founders believed that a republic could survive only if the people were virtuous, and only if they truly understood world history and our Constitution. Unfortunately, both of these purposes have been overshadowed and denigrated. The functional illiteracy rate in our country is way too high, and American history and civics is relegated to the back burner of our educational priorities. Studies upon studies reveal that our K-12 students 
college students and general public struggle with just the very basics of American history and civics, and actually it is worse for elected officials. For example, less than 50% of the people can now identify the three branches of government. This should not be too hard. We have legislative, executive, and judicial branches. That's it. Civics 101, less than 50% understand it. More pertinent to this episode, it is clear that most students have not been taught much about the Declaration of Independence, and remember even less. I have presided over 350 jury trials, and I usually begin by reciting the second paragraph of the Declaration. You know, the one that starts with, we hold these truths to be self-evident. And often it takes jurors three or four guesses before they can identify the source of these magnificent words. When I asked them how many were required to actually read the entire declaration while they were in school, usually less than 20% raised their hands. No wonder we don't understand it. This isn't just anecdotal evidence. It just illustrates what the studies reveal. This episode goes to the heart of the American experiment in self-government. We were the first country in human history to lay out, in writing, what we believed when we forged our nation. We laid out our origins, purpose, and founding first principles in the Declaration of Independence. Those first principles include unalienable rights, limited government, the social compact, equality, the rule of law, and the right to alter or abolish an oppressive government. My family has a long-standing tradition of reading the entire Declaration of Independence out loud on Independence Day. We usually have a big bash, and each attendee is required to read a sentence or two. Now, sometimes bombastic Brent Bassett, one of the contributing narrators on this podcast, has to host it for us, and we love that, and we continue the tradition there as well. But now this episode will be available for you and your friends and family to review at any time. You don't need a holiday to listen to or learn about the Declaration of Independence. We won't be stopping to comment on the text. That is for past and future episodes. And trust me, if you haven't listened to our series before, those episodes are taking deep dives into every sentence, phrase, and sometimes word of the Declaration of Independence. However, today we will address some of the historical background to help you gain a better understanding of the creation and meaning of the Declaration. With the outbreak of fighting in the colonies against British oppression, the British closed down and dissolved various colonial legislative bodies. And Virginia created a revolutionary government called the Virginia Convention. On May 15, 1776, the Virginia Convention passed a resolution instructing Virginia's delegates to the Second Continental Congress to propose to Congress that it should, quote, declare the United Colonies free and independent states, absolved from all allegiance to or dependence upon the Crown or Parliament of Great Britain." Unquote. In accordance with the state's instructions, and egged on by John Adams, Richard Henry Lee of Virginia moved on June 2, 1776, that the Second Continental Congress adopt the following resolution of independence. Quote, resolved that these united colonies are, and of right, ought to be free and independent states that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is, and ought to be, totally dissolved. That is expedient forthwith to make the most effectual measures for forming foreign alliances. That a plan of confederation be prepared and transmitted to the respective colonies for their consideration and approbation." Unquote. John Adams moved to second the motion. However, Wanting to ensure that all their states supported the resolution, Congress decided to delay consideration of the resolution until July. Meanwhile, on June 10th, the Congress decided that it should explain the reasons for independence, and this was very unique in the course of human history, if it was approved, by issuing a Declaration of Independence. Now, most people attribute authorship of the Declaration of Independence to Thomas Jefferson. And like much of what you learned in high school, that is partially true. On June 11th, the Second Continental Congress appointed a committee of five men to draft the Declaration. The most famous member was Benjamin Franklin. He was a worldwide celebrity. At the time, he clearly was the most notable and famous American in the world. From Pennsylvania, he was a printer, inventor, author, cultural and political critic, diplomat, and political leader. He was the only member of the committee who was not a lawyer. 
Another member was John Adams. He had eminently and successfully defended the soldiers who committed the Boston Massacre. He did so to protect liberty and to show the British that Massachusetts followed the rule of law. He was firmly committed to due process and equality under the law. He was a leading patriot in Boston, the epicenter of colonial resistance to British oppression. He was also the driving force to the adoption of the resolution approving independence, and he would earn the moniker Colossus of Independence. Roger Sherman from Connecticut was a former judge and extremely active member of Congress who served on several key committees. He was widely respected for his hard work and political acumen. He, and only he, signed the Continental Association, the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, and the Constitution. New Yorker Robert Livingston actively opposed British oppression as early as the Stamp Act and was likely a New York member of the Sons of Liberty and was a leading political leader in New York. And then, of course, there was Thomas Jefferson, a wealthy, aristocratic member of the planter class in Virginia. He was young, only 33, and caught the eye of Adams and the Continental Congress when he wrote, in 1774, a searing indictment of British oppression. The pamphlet was entitled, A Summary View of the Rights of British America, and eloquently attacked the British for attempting to squash freedom in America. The Congress likely expected Adams to primarily draft the Declaration. However, Adams had other ideas. He wanted Jefferson's eloquence to lead the day. Adams later wrote that he and Jefferson discussed the matter and that Adams pointedly told Jefferson to write it. Jefferson responded by asserting that Adams should do so. Adams replied, quote, I will not. Reasons enough. Jefferson replied, What can be your reasons? And Adams responded, Reason first. You are a Virginian, and a Virginian ought to appear at the head of this business. Reason second, I am obnoxious, suspected, and unpopular. You are very much otherwise. Reason third, you can write ten times better than I can. Unquote. Jefferson relented. He got to work and then shared his draft with the committee. Adams and Franklin made some suggestions, which Jefferson readily accepted. The final draft was completed and submitted to Congress in late June. And then a raging debate began on Monday, July 1st. Jefferson never said a word, while the Congress sliced and diced some of the draft. The critiques felt like dagger blows. Adams, on the other hand, defended the initial draft with all of his power. But Congress would have its way, and there were significant revisions, many which actually improved the flow, temple, vibrancy, and meaning of the draft, and some of which were unforgivable. The most infamous of these was deleting a passage condemning the king for perpetuating the slave trade. Meanwhile, the Congress debated Richard Henry Lee's resolution for independence and approved it on July 2nd. On July 4th, the declaration explaining Lee's resolution was ratified. A final version of the declaration was drawn up and signed on August 2nd. That is a long way of saying independence was technically established on July 2nd, 1776, that is when the Second Continental Congress meeting in Philadelphia, approved Richard Henry Lee's resolution, severing all ties with the English Empire and creating a new country. But we celebrate that independence on July 4th because it was then that the Congress approved the Declaration, which explained why we had become a new nation. And the new nation knew that it had given birth to a nation completely unique in human history. And now it is time for our reading. Gather your friends and family around to listen. It is good to be free and understand the foundation of our liberties. Here we go. In Congress, July 4, 1776. The unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, 
that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and accordingly all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer, while evils are sufferable, than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time after such disillusions to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers incapable of annihilation have returned to the people at large for their ex exercise, the state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states for that purpose obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners refusing to pass others to encourage their migration hither and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us, in times of peace, standing armies without the consent of our legislature. He has effected to render the military independent of and superior to civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation, for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them by mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses, for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule in these colonies, 
for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments, for suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burned our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny, already begun with the circumstances of cruelty and perfidy scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages, and totally unworthy of the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens, taken captive on the high seas, to bear arms against their country to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrection amongst us, and he has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince, whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant, is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attention to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. We must therefore acquiesce in the necessity, which denounces our separation, and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. We, therefore the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do, in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is, and ought to be, totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do, and for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance in the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Georgia, Button Gwinnett. Lyman Hall, George Walton, North Carolina, William Hooper, Joseph Hughes, John Penn, South Carolina, Edward Rutledge, Thomas Hayward, Jr., Thomas Lynch, Jr., Arthur Middleton, Massachusetts, John Hancock, Maryland, Samuel Chase, William Packa, Thomas Stone, Charles Carroll of Carrollton. Virginia, George White, Richard Henry Lee, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Harrison, Thomas Nelson Jr., Francis Lightfoot Lee, Carter Braxton. Pennsylvania, Robert Morris, Benjamin Rush, Benjamin Franklin, John Morton, George Clymer, James Smith, George Taylor, James Wilson, George Ross. Delaware, Caesar Rodney, George Reed, Thomas McKean. New York, William Floyd, Philip Livingston, Francis Lewis, Lewis Morris. New Jersey, Richard Stockton, John Witherspoon, Francis Hopkinson, John Hart, Abraham Clark. New Hampshire, Josiah Bartlett, William Whipple, Massachusetts, 
Samuel Adams, John Adams, Robert Treat Payne, Elbridge Jerry, Rhode Island, Stephen Hopkins, William Ellery, Connecticut, Roger Sherman, Samuel Huntington, William Williams, Oliver Wolcott, New Hampshire, Matthew Thornton. Dear Patriots, thank you for listening to the profound words of the Declaration of Independence. Some key takeaways from this episode. The United States of America became independent on July 2nd, 1776, when the Second Continental Congress approved a resolution of independence proposed by Richard Henry Lee and was given a second by John Adams. The Declaration of Independence was drafted by a committee of five, primarily by Thomas Jefferson, with assistance from committee members Benjamin Franklin and John Adams, with significant revisions by the Second Continental Congress. The Declaration was approved on July 4th. The Declaration of Independence is a monumental pivot point in history, forming for the first time a government established on the self-evident truths of the first principles of unalienable rights, limited government, the social compact, equality, the rule of law, and the right to alter or abolish an oppressive government. Please join us next time when we continue our exploration of the Declaration of Independence, when we examine the meaning of the unalienable right of the pursuit of happiness. Until then, have a most blessed Independence Day. God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you, patriots, for listening to Patriot Lessons. I'm David Drewicki, and we hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe to our podcast and rate us. That is, if you're going to give those five golden stars. We can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google, Anchor, and many other platforms. You can also learn more by visiting patriotweek.org. You can find lesson plans, TV episodes, and many other goodies. Patriot Week is celebrated every year from September 11, the anniversary of the terrorist attacks, through September 17, the anniversary of the signing of the Constitution. It has been recognized by the U.S. Senate and many states. Patriot Week was started by then 10-year-old Leah Warren when she pounded on the table and demanded a new celebration of America. You can follow us on Facebook, on our Patriot Week Foundation page, LinkedIn, and on Instagram at Patriot Week 1776. If you're interested in becoming involved in this grassroots effort or have any questions or comments, please send us a message on the social media platforms I mentioned or connect with Judge Warren directly at mwarren at patriotweek.org. Also consider Judge Warren's book, America's Survival Guide. How to Stop America's Impending Suicide by Reclaiming Our First Principles in History by visiting americasurvivalguide.com, Amazon, or any other online retailer. Until next time, God bless you and God bless America. Yeah.